What is that talking about? He's receiving what Jesus is saying. He's sitting up. He's receiving the word of God. He has clothes on, and now he's in his right mind, indicating to us the reason why he got over into this area where other demon power is because of his wrong, thinking wrong. <laughs> now, I guess I will mention this. Now, now this is now you can take this grain of salt or whatever, but I believe this this, this proves this out. When you look up the word unclean spirit. Especially in this case right here, you look it up in the Greek concordance or whatever, it means a demon of sexual perversion. So it's informing us the reason why this man got over in this area when demons begin to possess his life. Because I'm going to submit to you uh, that a demon cannot live inside of a person's spirit unless that spirit invites him to. Demon possession is the ultimate takeover by the devil. And a demon cannot just come and live inside someone's spirit. You have to, that's why the Bible tells us do not be inebriated through drugs and alcohol because your senses, your, 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 the guard to your spirit is your mind. Did you know that? The guard to your human spirit is your mind. And when you're knocked out of your senses, you're under the influence of something else, demons will whisper in your ear and say, can I come in? Can I come in? Can I come in? That's what they say. Can I come in? Can I come in? And you, uh, if you're under influence and you're at your weakest point, when you say yes, they enter in through your mouth into your spirit. Did you hear what I just said? When a man's spirit leaves his body, he breathes his last what? Breath. So the reason why this man is demon possessed is because of his bad thinking. That's why two men were involved. You see what I'm saying now? These two individuals were in sin. That's why these two individuals were living in the graveyard. You see it now? And Jesus said, I must go to the other side. So, but you know, Jesus went over there, delivered them. Notice we read, it said the demons begin to ask Jesus, Don't torment me. Now, you need to think about that for a moment. Because when we talk about right thinking, wrong thinking, which produces right believing or wrong believing. Now, who's afraid of who? <laughs> see, see, we see a Christian people are afraid of the devil, and if you are, you're thinking wrong. And you're believing wrong, which affects your behavior. It's called fear. Timidity. When you when you read the word of God, you're informed that your enemy and all demons are afraid of you because of who you are. See, if you think that way, you become a giant. But if you think the other way, you're a coward back in life. So here it is. They said, don't send us out of the country, but allow us to go into the pigs. So Jesus said, go into the pigs. Now what's interesting is Jesus allowed them to do this. Then the Bible says all of those 2,000 pigs, if you read in Mark chapter 5, over 2,000, they threw themselves off the cliff and were choked and drowned in the sea. Then it said the ones that were feeding them, those were the business owners that were taking care of, the, of these, these pigs. And so, it says, when they saw what was done to the pigs, not to the man, they're concerned about the pigs. Then they went and told it to who? The people in the city and all throughout the whole country. So when we read this story, just don't think it all happened in one day. Maybe it did happen in one day, but it just didn't happen in 30 minutes. This was the activity of the day. I mean, how long does it take you to noise and abroad through the whole city and the whole country? When they didn't have iPhones and, you know, <laughs> and things like that. They didn't, they didn't have cell phones like, guess what just happened over here in the land of the gallery? Guess what happened? No, no, they had to, they had to use a herald. They had to say, look, look, come out. Look what happened. They had to send people yelling through the city. And that took some time. But notice the whole city and the whole country, we just read, came out to see what was done to the pigs, and also they saw how this man was delivered. Because oftentimes people would try to go and help this, these two individuals, and they couldn't. That's why the Bible says they, they he broke the feathers and the chains, and so they tried to tame them and all that. So, all they, so they see all that. Now, you would have thought that would have been a great time point, Brother Ryan, to start a revival in that city and other countries. I mean, come on now. They, they, I mean, come on. Jesus in the house, he can set you free from all of this and all of that. But no, they said, no, nah, leave. Get up out of here. You say, why? Because they're thinking it's wrong. 
You say, what area? Because under Levitical law, it was illegal to have a business with an unclean animal. And pigs were unclean under Levitical law. So this business not only affected the farmers that owned the business, but if you look at it in context of the scriptures, this business was influencing the whole country financially. So, what did Jesus really do? He just didn't set a man free. He crippled the whole economic system of the whole country in the area of peace. Well, that's what God is mean. No, you shouldn't have been doing that legal business. You follow what I'm saying? So it crippled that whole business. And they were they were mad. So they refused to change their thinking in that area. They refused to change their thinking. And they know they were wrong for having that business. And I think it's interesting how you got people do a lot of things illegally financially and they think it's oh, okay. Wrong thing. But I'm just putting out the scripture right here that the reason why that happened is because they're wrong thinking. And notice they refused to change their thinking and they began to sit them out of, out of the country. But then on the other side, people were waiting for them. And they received them. They had the right thinking. And so in life, either we want to receive the word of God or we don't. And so the way we think affects how we believe. Now, believing can be translated into actions or behavior. So when we say the word, when we say I believe, just don't think as that's just a mental word. That's actually an action, but that's a verb. When we, when we say we believe, that translates into action. So if I say I believe that if I drink water, it's going to uh, quench my thirst, that means I have to have actions that follow up what I just said, that prove to you that I do believe that if I drink water, it'll quench my thirst. So when I'm saying thinking affects how we believe, meaning the way you think is how you're going to act. And how you think and how way you, in your behavior is going to actually come out of your mouth. So it affects your confession. So all these three components are tied to the way a man thinks. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Now if you read that, I just quoted the first part of the verse, but it goes, matter of fact, let's put this up so you see what I'm talking about. Uh, Proverbs 23, 7. We quote the first part, but I'm going to show you something right here. And that's why it's important for you to for you be a Holy Ghost person. You know what I mean by Holy Ghost person? Listen to the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. For as he thinking in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, say he to you, but his heart is not with thee. Now, let's translate the word heart. It's the word for mind. Now, he's saying, but it's what he's saying is, he's thinking one thing, but saying something different to you. What it's saying is we shouldn't just take people's word for it when they come and tell us about something, especially if some business deal. And then in your mind you're thinking, why is this person sharing this with me? Why are they talking to me about this? You have to be that type of person. Just don't take a person that face value and just leave everything they say out of their mouth because they could be thinking something totally different. But I will submit to you that if a person think this, thinks this way all the time, it, he will show himself up. He will be exposed. But the Bible is very clear as a person thinks that's what type of person he is. And I'm telling you, God looks on the inside of a man and he judges the way he thinks. He judges the way he thinks. I remember, you know, if you read the scriptures, and many times Jesus would be ministering, and the Bible says something like this, he knowing their thoughts, or he perceived their thoughts. And once he perceived their thoughts, then he would redirect his message towards them. And so Jesus is always trying to correct people's thinking. Mark chapter 1, put that up. Mark chapter 1. Let's look at, I don't know if I wrote this down, but I know, I know it's in Mark chapter 1. Yeah, Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. So Jesus really came to change the way people think. Mark chapter 1, it says, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Now the word re 
means to go back to the original state. The word pent, P-E-N-T, it means to think. So when Jesus is saying it, he says, I'm here to tell you to go back to the original way of thinking. And what he's referring to is, is the way man once thought in the garden. So I'm just trying to tell you the word of God is very clear. That a man, he doesn't even know if he's thinking wrong unless the word tells him. You and I don't even know our thinking is right, if it lines up or not um, out, outside of the word of God and outside of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's important for us to get to know the Holy Spirit because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit who comes from God, he'll be a comfort in you and he says he will teach you all things. So the Holy Spirit is a teaching spirit but he's not the only teaching spirit. You say, how? Because how? Peter, I mean, uh, Paul instructed Timothy he said, in the last days, many will depart from the faith, paying attention to doctrines or teachings of devils. So there are demons that are teaching spirits. So that lets you know right, right off the bat, there is no, uh, there is no I'm doing me or you doing you. There's no gray area. There's a dividing line. Either people are submitted to God's spirit or they're submitted to a demon spirit. That also teaches. In the world, the way people think, they either their thinking comes from demon spirits or their thinking is um, from the Holy Spirit. That's why family unit is so very important. Because the reason why there are people in the world, it came from a family unit. And the family, mommy and daddy, are the ones who had to have the right thinking. They got the right thinking, they have the right teaching going into those kids. But if they have the wrong thinking going into those kids, those kids go into society. And transmit that wrong thinking through their behavior and through confession. And then they produce other families like them. And that's why we have a world jacked up the way we got it. So it's important how you and I think and what we think about certain things when it comes to life and when it comes to things in the world, especially as a Christian person. Because either we're making this world a better place or we're making it worse off than what it already is. But Jesus came to change men's thinking. And so when, when the Bible says things like, you know, in John chapter 3, John chapter 3, verse 19. John chapter 3, verse 19. I think this is John chapter 3, verse 19. Yeah, that's it. And this is the condemnation or the judgment that light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds or their actions were evil. Now, if you look at this in context, how did men know that their actions were evil? Because Jesus gave them a set of work, different words. So, so when you think about when when, when, I, when I'm talking to you, I'm I, you have you're you're I'm letting you know what I think. That's what words are. It's a thought that is clothed. Words clothe thoughts. So you know what I'm thinking by what I'm saying. So when he came with a different set of words, his thinking exposed their actions. His thinking let them know that the way they were thinking and the way they were acting was wrong. And they didn't like that. Now, I have some things that I wrote down. I mean, you know, I said some on Thursday, but these are some things that just come to mind. I'm sure you can think about it yourself. But since, you know, this particular season, we have an election coming up, I think I, I, want to, I, I need to address that as a pastor. So this is my pastoral side. This is my gift. Am I required to vote as a Christian? Many Christians have that, that you know, does, you know, let's just tack that thing. You don't have to vote. It really don't matter anyway, because they're going to do what they want to do anyway. So my vote really don't count. So now I'm all up in your head now. Mm -hmm. and I'm, just, I'm just being real. You just say, and I'm not doing this for a part of God. I used to think this way. But I was wrong. You say, how did I know I was wrong? Because I read the book. And the book showed me up and, and, and corrected my thinking, therefore corrected my actions. Well, it doesn't really matter because they're going to do what they want to do. But, but see, there's something wrong with that thinking. Because it ain't about everybody else, it's about you. 
you will face God and give an account. And you can't tell God, well, I didn't do the right thing because they was going to do what they want to do anyway. He said, what's that got to do with your, your right decision? You see, my decision is not based on their illegal act. I just know that I'm going to do the right thing because I know this, that at the end of my life, God is going to hold me accountable for what I did, what was right. It's called righteousness. So I'm not, I'm not doing right based on what everybody else is doing. And because of that, I have the right thinking in there. And I don't even consider what they're going to do. I'm just going to do the right thing and be at peace. But I do have scriptures, though, because I don't want to just say up here that you're supposed to vote as a Christian, you know, and I'm not trying to use my position as a pastor to influence everybody. Because actually, you want to the truth, uh, separation of church and state don't even apply to us anymore. Thank God for that. It doesn't. Did you know that? It doesn't. Because Judge Kavanaugh got up and said, no, it doesn't apply anymore. All Christian prayers are now accepted once again in schools. See, that's what they're really afraid of. You said who? Not people. Demons. Those demons were stirring up people to try to prevent righteousness from prevailing in life. But if you're a believer who's good in anything you're thinking, you go to heaven for all the world. That's why it's important for us to let the Holy Spirit and his work influence our thinking about people's actions and things that go on in the world. We have to see, we have to judge the behavior that's going on in the world through biblical glasses, which helps our thinking stay in line. So am I, supposed, am I required to vote as a Christian, or am I only supposed to pray? Well, you, you have to do both. Deuteronomy 30, 19, this is my voting scripture. Come on, you say, how is it your Because, you know, let's think, let's think about this for a moment. Let's try to be real practical. How do you know when you read your Bible, it doesn't really tell you where you're supposed to work to get a job? Or what your work should be. It doesn't. You, I don't know. I never opened the Bible and said, "Gerald Lynn Bookman, this is what your work's going to be." I wish it was like that. I wish I could open up the Bible and find that. How do you know that's not in the Bible like that? How do you know it's also not in the Bible which type of car you should drive? Did you know that? Yeah. I wish I could read, open up the Bible and say, "Gerald, you will own a Ford or whatever in the Bible," but that's not in the Bible. But yet, in the Word of God, there are answers to those questions. That's why you have to discern the Spirit. Did you know there's multiple scriptures in the Bible that give you a right to believe God for a vehicle? In any one you want. Whether it's a Ford, Audi, Mercedes, BMW, it doesn't matter what the name of the product is, but it gives you a right to believe God for transportation. Here's one right here. Jesus was getting ready to enter into a city and he needed transportation. So he used to send his disciples ahead of him to find a donkey that was tied up no one had written on. And only donkeys were owned by wealthy people. So Jesus didn't say go into town and find a horse. And I'm sure there were horses. So Jesus chose to ride in on a BMW versus a Ford. You said, what's wrong with riding the Ford? Nothing. But he chose, he always thought, see, his thinking was always the best. He had a right to the best, they think, that's the way he thought. So he said he rode on a donkey that no one had ever ridden on. And then what the Bible says. But how many of you ever heard this thinking right here? It's not good for you to go and buy a brand new car because as soon as you buy a brand new car and you drive off the lot, it loses its value. So go ahead and buy a used car. And so now if you yield to that type of thinking, now you're thinking that all you do is own a used car because of the value. Now who has more value, the car or you? You see, that's the problem with the thinking. Because I have more value, I, I'm sure that thing is going to depreciate because I'm more valuable than it. So that just helps some people right there. You see what I'm talking about? Just stupid, goofy thinking has prevented us from believing God for the very best of Sunday. But anyway, he does it. That's a new scripture. That's a scripture. That's just one of them. Then there's one that says, He'll cause me to ride prosperously on the earth. First of all, I cannot ride on this earth if my car keeps rocking down. That ain't riding prosperously, it's riding broken. <laughs> I mean, I know that's, that ain't correct, right? But I mean, you know. <laughs> 
I mean, come on, think about it. You know, uh, Katie and I were talking about this some time back, and she, I think, I don't know if you brought it up, I think you might have brought it up. She brought up how this car she used to drive. She used to drive in this car, but you know what? She was thankful. She does. She always said she was thankful. And then you should. She said she was always thankful, but she always had to put water in. And I think it was a short time she would drive here to church. And then you know, you know, just you know, you know, you, know, you just you don't want to see you don't want anybody to see you put water in. So you just can't wait till everybody stop fellowship and leave the church because you know that put water. In. But you go get another. You remember that sister? Kay? You see, you see, but thank God she don't have to do that anymore. You see what I'm saying? God doesn't want us to be dealing with things that break down. He wants to get to our, get us to get to our de destination safely, in comfort, and in style. Because we got things to do, we got places to go, and it's just not the work. He might tell you he wants you to go to a meeting in another state, and he don't never he never wants you to disobey him by saying no, I can't because of my job. You want to just be able to just say, hey, I'll go, I'll do it, Lord, I'll do it, Lord. And not you be concerned about stopping every five miles for water in. How long would that take you to get to? How long would that take? You understand the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> but you know, the Bible, we, we all know we have to have some type of work or a job. Because the Bible says, if a man don't work, he don't, he don't deserve to eat. So that let me know, i got to have some type of work. Actually, you can turn that around and say this. Don't think you're going to eat if you ain't working. Because he didn't call us to be beggars. There are no beggars in God's kingdom, except the ones that are not born again. So, when, he said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging. For bread. So that lets me know right now, I'm not supposed to be going through life begging. Amen. It's true. And I have to get on that level of thinking. But let's go back to voting. Deuteronomy 30, 19. I just want to give you examples like that to show you that when you read the word of God, the Holy Ghost said, that's your voting scripture right there. That's what happened to me. He said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. That I have set before you life and death Blessing and cursing. Therefore, pray about life. No, he said choose. Meaning vote. The word choose here means vote. Vote for life. Why? That both you and your seed, your children may live. Now, if, that, if that's not even clear, that we have a responsibility to vote, then I don't know what can be even clear to you. You say, why? What does it matter? He just told us. Did you know... Let's, let's, let's not talk about Democrat and Republican. Let's, let's get outside. Let's get out. Let's get beyond that. Let's get beyond that. Let me, let me tell, before I go and say what I'm saying, let me tell you what, the reason why I'm saying this. When I was a young man, then I came and moved down here from uh, high school. I decided I wanted to go to college here, so I lived with my grandma for a while. And my grandmother was heavily, uh, she was connected to the NAACP. And uh, she tried to get me to join that organization. I never did. Uh, thank God I did. I just, you know, God just had a way of protecting me. I was strong-willed, wasn't weak-minded. I just, I ain't doing that mess. I mean, I just, I just, I just, I just, I just, I just, I'm not doing that. You know, because I'm, I'm not yielded to this whole black thing or whatever. Even though I went to a black college, but that was a reason why I went there. But anyway, um, so I said, no, I'm not doing that. And then it was understood that because I was African-American that I'm automatically a Democrat. And there's a reason for that thinking and that behavior in the African African American community. Because this was, I don't know about anybody else, but this was what was taught to me. This was the thinking. That Republicans, all they were which were a bunch of wealthy conservatives. They were only looking out for their interests. But they didn't look out for the low class and the middle class. That was the thinking. I mean, am I, am I telling the truth? So now, the thinking was, there's a problem with that. The thinking was, you as a black man can't have anything as long as the Republicans are in office. Because they don't have your back, financially. Now, 
I can never aspire to have dreams as an African American if I buy into that thinking that I could be my own business owner and get ahead and be a wealthy person because somehow Republicans are holding me back. Because it was a lot of them in the, Democrat, in the Democratic administration, they would have programs set up to tap in the tax dollars to help them in their poverty. Now that's a mouthful what I just said, help them, actually let me say it like this, they help them stay in poverty. The whole, one of the big things, the reason why a certain group of people didn't want President Trump to get, up, to get elected as president is because if you don't know if you remember prior to the election, they had a lot of things about Planned Parenthood. Because of a lot of programs, he was going to cut out. Basically what he was doing, he was cutting the funding. Well, I think he was doing that. He was choosing life over there. You see what I'm saying? And we make, oh, here's the wrong thinking. Oh, you're a preacher. You're not supposed to be talking about politics in the pulpit. But am I talking about politics or am I talking about life and death? I'm not talking about politics. That's what they do. I'm not, oh, I can't talk about politics. I don't know what it means to be a politician. I'm talking about life and death. So, but you know the Bible, you said the Bible doesn't tell me how to vote. I, I'm not, I don't know if I'm supposed to vote Republican or Democrat. But that's not what he said. He said, when we go in that voting booth, we need to know what they think. How do I know what they think? By what's said about them. The bio that's, 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 that's written up on them, that's what they believe. So if I read that, do my research, because really a lot of Christians are lazy. They don't want to put in the work to go read all that stuff about the candidates. Because you could walk in that voting booth and have a mixture of people that you vote for. You could be voting for some Democrats and some Republicans because of their belief systems. <laughs> because I understand the way I'm supposed to vote when I go in that voting booth, I'm supposed to know something about the person I'm voting for. And this is, these are the main issues he tells us. He, don't, he said, don't even get caught up on the side issues. You know what the side issues are when you look at our country? On oh, who is gonna, who's going to benefit the most from which administration being elected financially? We, those are side issues to you and I because that government that doesn't govern our prosperity anyway. But what, but, but what we look for when we go in that voting booth is who's for life and who's for death. And if this person's for death, I'm a resistance there. I don't elect that person. That's right. Because they're all about killing life. So that's what I look for. We don't get hung up on the side issues. Where they, you know, somebody told me this once before, a true story. Said, well, I don't vote. I don't vote, and this is what that person tell me. They said, well, I, I voted for this person to be president, even if they were against this, because people are going to get abortions anyway. You know, that is an ignorant statement. Let me tell you why. That is an ignorant statement. Let me tell you why. Most people do not understand this, that a lot of people that do get abortions, they go through the system, the ones that the states have set up on their individual level. And so if everybody on the individual level goes into those booths and vote against that, there will be no place for them to go except the back alleys. You say, what, what's the thing with that? Uh, when a lot of them start dying in the alleys, they ain't going to start, they ain't going to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. They'll probably have to leave this country to go to another country to do it. That's not my issue whether people are going to do it or not. Well, I'm going to go ahead. This is no, no difference. Well, I'm going to go ahead and vote for marijuana for when we get marijuana anyway in the state of Texas. Because folks smoking marijuana anyway. And I just feel like that if we legalize it, it'd be less crime. Do you just realize what you said and how you're thinking? It's illegal whether or not they legalize it anyway. You say, how? Oh, because I'm in the kingdom. Did you know wherever they legalize it, they can't keep that money in banks? Did y'all know that? Because it's a federal crime. It's against federal law to keep drug money in any bank. So now what you've actually done is cause people to be more unsafe than they were. Because all you're dealing is cash now. But anyway, so when I go in there, 
That's what I'm looking for. Now you say, I'm not, what about the prayer part? First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Look at this. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. So they all settle that issue right now where am I required to vote or not? Because really when you don't vote, because you live in a country that, does, that, that, that has a voting process, you vote by default. When you don't vote, your vote counts as what? See, some people, some of y'all about to say, some of y'all think it's a trick question. Some of y'all think, well, it counts as nothing. No, it counts. It counts as a loss. Come on, think about it. It can't count as a win. It counts as a loss. And then, you're thinking wrong if you have a right, think you have a right to complain about the person who's in office and you haven't voted. Why talk about it? It doesn't matter anyway. But anyway, this is what Paul struck to Timothy. He said, I exhort you, therefore, that second, third, no, he said, first, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Did you hear what he just said to Paul? To, 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 now he's writing the instruction as a pastor, which a pastor has the greatest position in the land because he's instructed people with the word of God. And see, so, so he said this is God's thinking. He's thinking about people in positions of authority. And he knows that people's lives are directly affected by the ones that are in positions of authority. Isn't that what he just said? So he said, pray for them. But let me get, let's get something straight. How can you effectively pray for them if you ain't even voted for them? You follow what I'm saying? Now, now you said, now I, 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 I need to clean that one up too. What if you voted for the right person? You say, how do you know they're the right person? You're talking about right thinking, wrong thinking. The way you know they're right is by what's listed about them. You, you get inside information, how they think and what they believe. What happens if you vote for the right person and the wrong person gets them in? That's the you have to pray for them. But, how do we pray for them? Did you know there's a scripture? The Bible says we have a right. We can pray and ask God that the wicked be uprooted out of the land. So when I know of a wicked person in a position of authority, I'll go to God concerning that individual. I do not backbite. I do not uh, down that person. I don't talk about it because the Bible says don't rejoice, even rejoice when the enemy falls. Say, ha, 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 yeah, he got what he deserved. No, when you're doing, you know, you're supposed to even do that. So I go to God and say, look, this is a wicked person in office. I'm asking you to uproot him because the Bible says I can. I pray that he's uprooted. Give him another position somewhere, but just not in the Senate seat where laws are affected. Get him a job somewhere else. That's how I pray. And that, and you say, why? Because I want to lead a good, quiet, peaceful life in all godliness. Because when people get elected to positions of authority, especially in our government, they are changing laws and doing things that can affect honesty and godliness in the land. Here's one right here. They just had somebody over here, I believe it was in Bel Air, over here in Houston, where they, like, I got an email the other day, I can go do this during the week, where I can go do storytelling to some kids at the school. Which, oh. if you have, which if you have time to do that, you probably can't. I mean, it'd be a great thing to do if you have time to do it. Well, they had a guy over in Bel Air, a transgender person. Yeah. They allowed him to do storytelling to a bunch of kids. Yeah. And then eventually he started trying to push his beliefs and his thinking on the kids. Mm -hmm. And the kids look at him like, who is this? Reading story time to it. Now if a bunch of kids got enough sense to know that a person that's trans dress, a, dressing like a, a woman should be reading to them, who are we as adults and the Christians think that's okay? Because children are having innocence about their spirit. And they will know some whether it's right or wrong. But it takes us when we get adults and we get indoctrinated by demons. They say, well God loves everybody. He does. That's why he sent Jesus to die for you. So you can be delivered from your sin. So, that's the voting and the prayer responsibility. Here's one right here. Are there many ways to heaven? Now, we don't take that in here, but I had to mention this one because uh, I just read some statistics recently that more and more evangelical people, which are people like us that 
Mm -hmm. when they, the people they consider evangelical people that believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, more evangelicals are believing that there's more than one way to heaven. They're actually buying into that and saying that, hey, I do believe they're a more good person, they pray, and they're not doing bad things. I can't see why a loving God will deny them access to heaven. Well, they're leaning to their own understanding, which the Bible says do not do. Their thinking about God's love is totally wrong. Because if you look at 1 Timothy, go to verse, I think it's in verse 5. Look what it says. For there is one God and 50 mediators. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, 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 come on. It just says only one. The word, the, now, come on now. The word mediator is a bridge. That's the, it's the word bridge. They ain't 50 different bridges. Or it can be a different word for ladder. Everybody walking around with their lives. <laughs> Come on, can you think about that? My ladder's going to work. My ladder's long enough. No, I guess it's not. It can't reach. As soon as you put your ladder down, it falls. And you're going to fall in there with your ladder. But that's, you know that's what that's talking about? For there's one God and one ladder, one bridge between God and men, the man, Muhammad. But don't say that. They say Christ Jesus. So you got a bunch of Christian people going back on what they say they once believed. They said there are different ways now to get the God. And then John 14, 6, Jesus said, He said, I am the way. I am the truth. Nobody comes to the Father except but by me. He said, by me, not by any other person. So we understand this. Look here, I don't care how much you love Johnny. I don't care how much you love your mom and your grandmother and your stepdad and your daddy or whoever's in your family. If they are just simply wrong, they're wrong. And don't try to change your thinking to match what they're thinking so you can feel good. I think it's a tragic thing. I do. I don't take it lightly. I'm sure a lot of us have loved ones in here that are not born again yet. And they're on their way to hell. And it just absolutely grieves us when we think that they can actually die and wake up in hell. Who wants to think that about their loved ones? I don't. And it's not comfortable to think that. But not one minute am I going to change the way I think to satisfy my hurt that I feel for them on the inside. If not anything, I'm going to keep praying for them, believing God for them, that they get born again, that things will get turned around, keep breaking demonic power. See, that's right thinking. And if they die, in their sin and go to hell? That's not on me, that's on you. And that's not an easy pill to swallow, but that's but you just have to swallow it. I remember Brother Aiden talking about some of you all I burned the DVD and how he had gone to hell twice when he was on his deathbed and he and, 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 and he asked God he, and actually he escaped the throes of hell and accepted Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior. And then uh, I think it was his aunt. His aunt was getting ready to die. She sent for him, and he went over there and prayed over, was praying with her while she was dying. And, and she called out, help me, help me, kid, help me, kid. And he understood what that was. She was slipping over in the head. She, he said she died and went to hell before she got born again, and she was over there. And he said, absolutely grieved her. And the reason why he knew is because of what he experienced. And so, uh, that's one area right there. Oh, here's a big one right here. What about Halloween? What about Halloween? I mean, you drive by a bunch of churches. I'm sure y'all seen them. Trunk or tree at a bunch of churches. No, I'm serious. Trunk or tree. So we're going so, 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 so we to have trick or treat at the church. It's safe. We're going to have out of, and all really what Halloween is about, this is to be honest, come on. This is what really Halloween's about. It ain't even really about dressing up in the costumes. It's about a bunch of kids excited about they're going to get some candy on one day out of the year. A bunch of candy. They go, and they're trying to get the biggest receptor they can get. They'll fill up their bag. They left for us as a brown bag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to give us a brown bag. You know, they say, you ain't getting that deal. You ain't getting no pumpkin. It was bigger. You only get the brown bag. 
We got a little lunch bag, brown bag. And we try to get that thing filled up. Remember, Brother Scott, we go from house to house, and we looking in the bag, we shaking. We say, I only got mine. I'm almost full. Then come get some more house before we go home. Because you know your mama sometimes say, be on my so and so. And we try to make sure our bag is full before we go. So Halloween really to us was all about just getting candy. But really, we were ignorant of the fact that it is a demonic holiday that is equivalent to the holiday we celebrate once a year called Easter. Halloween is about celebrating the dead. The decorating of the pumpkins is all about and the reason why you decorate. Most people, when they decorate the pumpkin, you know why they don't leave it inside? You know why they're supposed to, why they set it by the front door? It's because they're supposed to ward off evil spirits. That's why you draw. That's why you uh, draw the hideous face. Look at it, because it's supposed to frighten away the the, the the demonic spirits. I have a whole teaching on this on the website. I'm not gonna get it. <laughs> but I was a Christian who used to celebrate Halloween. I go to the haunted houses. I said, yeah, let's go to that haunted house. I mean, I, I'm looking at look at that next Halloween movie coming out, man. Shoot, I can't wait. See if see if Michael Myers really gonna get caught. And I'm sure a bunch of Christians wouldn't go see this one. You know why I say that? Because for years we were left hanging when we were out there in the world. And now years later, Michael Myers finally going to get his, and then they talked about he was, was going to finally reveal his face and what he looked like, and then put his mask on. So I know a bunch of Christians went to go see that. Because now they get closure. <laughs> I mean, come on now. I mean, come on now. You said, you said, you said, how do I know? Because I had that thought in my head. I had that thought in my head to my man, you can, you can watch that man and see what Michael Myers really is. I mean, I was like, no, I'm not going to watch that mess. And then when it come on demand, I'm not still not going to watch it when it's free. Yeah. You see, you see what I'm saying? I'm just going to turn it on and see who Michael Myers is going to turn it off. Don't, don't even turn that thing on. I'm just telling you how people, how, 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 how your thinking can be harmful for you. Well, it ain't nothing wrong with Halloween. I, I don't dress my kids up in the scary stuff. I, I let them go as a Bible character. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's so amazing wrong with that thinking. First of all, we have to ask ourselves two questions. Did the disciples practice Halloween? Did they dress up as Bible characters? We know the answer is no. You say, why? Because they are Bible characters. And then we don't understand when we're saying as Christians, I'm going to dress my kid up as a Bible character. Why? He already is one. We're already Bible characters. You say, why? We have character is. Character it comes from the word means behavior, how a person acts and responds. Meaning I'm already a Bible character. I have my behavior based on biblical principles, which makes me a Bible character. You're a Bible character too. So I'm always dressed up like a Bible character. But you see, but, but, but this is what they don't realize. Ephesians 5.11. See, the scriptures settles all debate in our mind and what we're thinking and we can either choose what God thinks or choose to go in our own way, which is eventually harmful. I had somebody, they don't go here to church anymore. I talked this whole series on Halloween and true story. Right after I finished, this person came up to me and said, I heard what you said, but every time a preacher hears that, they already know their butt's in the way. And this is what they said. I heard what you said, but when I do my pumpkins, I don't say, I say that's not what it means. Doesn't matter. You still participate. Because the scripture says, have no fellowship. Now, 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 what is the word no fellowship? So I'm just asking a question. Now, I'm telling you, I'm not trying to meddle or anything. I'm not, look, I just know what the Spirit of God says to me. Like Bobby Ennin one time said, that's his anointing. We <laughs> can flow with his own anointing. Now, when I read that one day, this is what the Holy Ghost said to me. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. And he said, I didn't ordain any church to have any so-called 
Halloween alternatives. He said, because you're still fellowshipping with the work of darkness. If it's righteous, how come we don't pick other days and say we're going to have a hallelujah harvest and come dressed up like a Bible here? But we choose to do it on that day, the 31st, and we say it's a safe alternative because we don't want our kids out there. But we want them in here doing a ritual that causes them to fellowship with the work of God yeah. in the church. Because it's, it's about the work. See, he said the works of darkness. Aren't we still dressing up? Aren't we start, still giving away candy? Only thing that's different from them doing it is that they're ignorant and we're informed. So he told me, he said, as a pastor, never have a hallelujah harvest. And he said, others that have it, if, you, if you're in relation with them, tell them what I've showed you. If they'll listen. That's what he said. And if they don't, just, just don't they even consider it. Here's one I heard. Because we've heard all the children's ministry did it meet. This is one thing I remember coming to my mind. Because when the pastor used to say it. Well, the reason why we have a hallelujah harvest is because we don't put a, put a lot of pressure on the kids. We don't want to put a lot of pressure on the kids, you know, because you know, they're just children. I have to ask myself this question. Did Jesus think that way when he was finishing the kids? Did the so-called Bible character in the Bible think about that was pressure? Did Abraham think about that when he was, that's why the Bible says God chose Abraham because he would be faithful to communicate the word of God to him? Did he think that was pressure? What he thought was pressure is for them not to know the word of God. He, that's the pressure he thought. Here's another one right here. Well, I'm going to tell my kids that Santa Claus is real. I mean, they're not real. I'm just going to tell them that Santa, well, Santa Claus is real. I'm just going to tell them Santa Claus is real because it's just, you know, I don't want to let them know because, you know, it kind of takes the fun out of it, so, so whatever. That, 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 you think a kid really cares? Now, I mean, the one that's been told all his life that Santa Claus is real, and you tell them that he's not, then he does care because he thinks Santa is the one bringing him all the gifts. But let's get to the root of the matter. He thinks that if Santa Claus is not real, he ain't going to get no more gifts. Because he thinks he thinks Santa came down his chin down. He thinks Santa he thinks Santa is the source of all those gifts the next morning. He thinks Santa came down his chimney that night to do all those gifts on the tree. And Johnny didn't realize he ain't got no chimney on his house. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on now, you see what I'm saying? You, 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 you see what I'm saying? Most of the houses that are built here in the south don't have chimneys. And most of those kids that they said came down the chimney, their parents let them think that. Am I telling the truth? How we got flat? When I say flat, we high kids come home and kids are mad at our kids because they tell other kids Santa ain't real. And then and then that kid go tell their mama and daddy. And then parents are upset and they want to hear mom say, uh, you know, why uh, is your kid telling my kids Santa ain't real? Because he not. I mean, I mean. I mean, we're not going to back down. Because if some parent came to me, I said, produce evidence. Because I, because see, you got, the, the Bible says, be ready to give an answer according to the hope that's what I'm saying. See, I did all my research. You know who Santa really is? St. Nicholas. That's what Santa, and he was a guy, he was a Christian. Who saw a bunch of kids in his community that were not fortunate enough to get gifts. And so what he did, he started giving out gifts to poor kids. And now we didn't we didn't we didn't just hype that thing up. Now we put them on some reindeer and the sled, you know. And, and now we now he ain't living on the North Pole. And now he got elves making toys for all the kids in the world. And then we got a bunch of propaganda on television. We got Rudolph. We got the elves on the cartoons. You said should, I, I should let my kids watch it. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is. We need to inform them what the truth is because a lot of us tell the truth. We go watch a bunch of movies that stuff is not even real. There's no way a person can be in a gunfight and 50 people shooting at him and he not get hit. I mean, that, I mean we know that's fantasy. That, that, that's Hollywood. He gonna get a bullet grade somewhere. So we all watch things that have nothing to do with the real reality, but we just know how to disconnect because we know the truth. 
And I'm just saying when it comes to our kids, we shouldn't think of them as any less because they're small. No, God, that's not what the Bible says. We communicate to them the truth whatsoever. I remember this minister one day, one year, he realized that his children had some wrong thinking and said, it's Christmas. You know what I'm talking about. And so one year, his kids got up. <laughs> it was like, uh, where the kids at? Now, they, didn't, they, 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 they knew Santa wasn't here. But they were expecting to get gifts at Christmas time. So they got up and said, like, y'all playing. <laughs> y'all just, just playing. Look at the gifts at. They're looking at closets. They said, no, we ain't buying the gifts. And his children were upset. And the Holy Ghost told him to do it. Why? To correct their thinking. So he sat his kids down. He said, let me tell you what the problem with your thinking is. And he asked them this question. He said, how many times did people bless you this year? How many gifts did you receive from other people? And they begin to name off one more, one more, one more. He said, so you are blessed all throughout the year, and you will let one day ruin your whole year. So it corrected the thinking in the area of Christmas time. Get, give me, give me, give me, get, get, get. We did this to our kids, didn't we? We only got one gift. And they open their gifts and kind of look at them. <laughs> like, what other gifts that? You say, well, I, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that pressure. I'm not doing that pressure. I'm not going through that pressure as a parent. And getting all these toys and stuff, and you only going to play with one of them and break all of them. <laughs> like, you were telling me the story how all these kids had all these fancy toys, and all they do was want to play with the cardboard boxes. Look, 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 kids, look, kids, look, kids, look. Kids are not thinking the way we think. Let me tell you what's wrong with that thing. Because really, parents let a lot of peer pressure get on them. They're trying to impress the Joneses. I'm going to have my party at Build-A-Bear. You know what's Build-A-Bear? Now, you can do it too. But if you can't do it, don't do it. And then be mad that you did it. After everybody go home and look at the bill. And you're paying for it for the next two years. People do that when it comes to weddings. You know, when you get them, when you marry that woman, you got to at least get a carry. I mean, I mean, you know, there's a lot of pressure on a man. No, I mean, you should. Yeah. That, that woman agrees to marry you, you should do your very best. And believe God. I'm not, I'm not trying. I'm just talking about a bunch of people put pressure on. And really tell you the truth, a woman worth the salt, she don't care if he gives her a little strawberry. She just want to be with that. She do care a little bit. <laughs> she, she, she her eyebrow with her. <laughs> but you understand the point I'm trying to make. People spend all this money on these weddings, fifty thousand, hundred thousand, and then three months they get they get the divorce or get the divorce, and you just spend all that money, you still paying them. <clears throat> just some crazy, just some crazy stuff. We said, but Halloween though, how, it's an unfruitful work of darkness, and no Christian shall have any part to do with it. When Wednesday comes, I, I tell to I told to myself, I said, I'm so excited when it rains on Halloween. <laughs> like last year, when it was a rain out last year, I think it was a rain out last year. Well, one of those days, I was so happy. I was like, thank you, Lord, for sending the rain. <laughs> and like, we looked at the news last night. It's supposed to be 50% chance of rain. I said, I hope that's in the evening time. <laughs> Seriously. Because you say, why? Because I think about it from the right point of view. Because really, if, if, if the story be told, we used to have an FBI, ex-FBI agent who scored our church in Colorado. And she used to tell us the things that went on on October 31st. All the baby sacrifices, the drinking of the blood, and things like that. See, most Christians don't realize that those things really go on. You know, could it be sometimes when kids are missing, they kidnap them from sacrifices? See, a lot of things we don't know. But those are things that do go on. And because of that, we just have nothing to do with it, not going to participate in it, not going to say we, we're not doing it because we have an alternative. No, there is no alternative. The, the alternative is don't do it. Obey the word. Amen? Mm -hmm. Now, let me say one more thing with you we're going to go. Uh, Proverbs 4. But you know, I will say this. I never got into condemnation when God corrected my thing. Because I understood this. I mean, all, I'm, all, I'm, all, I'm a product of what was taught to me and I'm a product of my environment. But the beautiful thing about when Jesus comes in your life, 
he really comes in to correct all of that. And the reason why he's correcting all of that is because if you go back to Deuteronomy, we're not going to go there, but if you go back to Deuteronomy 30, 19, he said something in the beginning. He said, he said, I bear a record against you. I set heaven and earth against you. What he's talking about there is spiritually. He said, either heaven backs you or demon powers back you in life. And God is always on this side of the line. And we can't say God will cross, God crossed this line to go deliver people. But God's not living over here. God's living over here. And so once I come into the kingdom, positionally and spiritually, I'm here. But so many times I'm here and trying to live here and expect God to bless my life. And he will not and he cannot. Why? Because that's just not simply where he is. If he tells me have no fellowship, have no cone in here, don't hang out with the uncle who works the doctor, you think he's hanging out there? No, he's not. And so because he wants the very best for me, I would have to change my thinking because it was only, it'll only be through the change of my thinking that I know that what I'm doing is wrong. And when I know what I'm doing wrong and I make the change, then I start to do it, do it and hang out with him. So it's not really about condemnation. It's about rightly aligning myself so I can experience really God in my life. That's what it's really about. I don't know anybody that becomes a believer who doesn't want to experience God in their life. And I think it's interesting how, you know, I mean, just even the short years we've been ministering the Word of God, the number one area that we come up against is people refusing to change their mind to match what he has said. Yeah. That is the major challenge. Because even Paul said it. You want to be transformed? Change, do it by the renewing of your mind. There is no other way. They want to experience the blessing of God, but refuse to change. And that takes work, and it takes effort, and it takes study. Just like, for example, when God revealed to me about, I mean, come on now. I mean, you know, I don't like to go and read a bunch of stuff. Now, I, I, I used to hate reading. Now, I like reading. Now, I like reading biblical stuff. Well, I'm sure I can say that. I like that. I enjoy that. But when it comes to reading natural stuff, you got to get on there and look at the canon. they got a long Bible. I don't want to read all that. But, you, but if you're going to do right, you just have to put yourself through that. And it takes effort. And I think sometimes that carries over to the Word of God. When you have to understand that naturally your flesh does not want to obey God. I think if we really understood that, we would make things a lot easier for ourselves. And we wouldn't beat ourselves up. Because it's naturally for you to feel like you don't want to come to church. It's natural for you to feel like you don't want to read your Bible. Because your flesh is contrary to doing what's right. And it's the last part of you that's going to be actually fully redeemed. So, but the but the way to do that is, I, I, you know what, it's going to go there. It's going to Romans 7, since I'm saying Romans 7. Romans 7, look at this right here. Romans 7. <clears throat> Notice what he said in verse 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Let me say something about your inward man to really you. And this is why it's so important to go to, to hear the right people. When I say the right people, there are some people that are right, and there are some people that are wrong. Let me say this again. There are some people that are right, and there are some people that are wrong. There are not there are some people right, and there are some people that are a little right. Now, if somebody came and told me that my wife Describe to me my wife and what she looked like. I'm like, yeah, that's Tadasi. And they said the same breath that she's a murderer and she don't care about people. I'm like, mm, they can describe her so they know who she is. But what they said about her is a lie, so therefore I don't receive anything they say. Why are a bunch of Christian folks going to a bunch of churches, listening about people describe Jesus? Yeah, they talk about Jesus, but then talk about his behavior. They say he doesn't heal. Are they right or are they wrong? They're wrong. And we try to explain that to our kids. We say, we say, you know, there ain't no such thing as a small little white lie. When is a, a lie white? You know what I mean by that? When is a lie pure? Yes. They didn't tell a little white lie, they told a little dark lie. <laughs> so we explain this to our kids that because sometimes they think it's okay. I'm right, I'm really right, but I just told a little small not tr the truth. You know what I'm saying? We say, okay, go and get your Kool-Aid. And I'm sure you can find a little pool out in the uh, somebody's yard. And we're just going to put a little flake in it. Would you drink that? Oh, no, you put poop in it. Well, you'll throw the whole thing away, right? But it, now I'll step it up. I said, but it's more Kool-Aid than it is poop. 
So you're not even going to taste it. It's not, it doesn't even matter. Yes, it does. I said, so, oh, you think it matters because it's a little flake of movement. What's the difference in what you say? So you're really saying that it does matter if you tell you a lie. So there are those that are right. Now, I didn't say we know everything that is right. But I'm saying the part we do know, Paul even said it, we ought to be right on. And this is the thing that we are right on. That man is a three-part being. He has first spirit, soul, and body. Did you know most believers don't believe that? They believe soul and body. And you'll say, you say, my body and my soul, boy. And then, then you see how they're being led now. They're led by the bodies and then they think later. But really, their thinking is the reason why they live by with their body first. But notice Paul said, my delight should be after the spirit. Just so we have to know something about the spirit. This is it. Your spirit is perfect. You're already perfect before God. Your spirit knows right and only wants to do right. So the key is, is tapping into my real self, my inner core, and to be, and let my inner man lead. Because he can't do it by himself. He needs to hook up with something to, 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 to come out. And for, that's what Paul's talking about. He said, I for, the, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my body warring against what? law of my mind. The law of my mind. What? It's a law. You know what? Now, now, if you understood this, laws are things that are fixed. If he, what he's saying here, if you get the law of your mind right, the law of the inward man will come out. That's what he's talking about. It's a spiritual thing. And he goes on to say this. It is bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Now, a lot of people read that, and when the word sin is mentioned, this is what we've got to renew our mind. People start thinking about sexual sin, lying, cheating, adultery. That's true. But the word sin, the Greek word for sin, is what? Error. Whether it's adultery, lying, cheating, it's still all error. So, obviously, you know, what he's talking about here is if you want to stop your life from getting in the, going in the wrong direction, if you want to stop a bunch of errors in your life, I don't know anybody that wants to work on a computer and get error, error, error. You go, I gotta get a new computer. <laughs> Start doing it right. So I don't know a bunch of Christians who want to keep get, being in error. Well, the way to stop being in error is you have to find a law to get involved in that will eliminate the error. And he's talking about your mind, he's talking about renewing your mind. Because in the law of your members, it naturally wants to do the wrong thing. How many of y'all know that? Come on. Yeah. We know that. And it says, oh, wretched man that I am. You are wretched if you, can't, if you can't override this. But notice what he said. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? He said, I thank God. That's hope. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, then he gives the key, the answer. So then with the mind, I serve the law of God. What's the law of God? Let's go back and read it. Let's go back and read it. Verse 22. I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So what's the law of God? The inward man. He said, I thank God that through I serve the law of God with my mind. So the way you get your inward man to dominate is by mind renewal. It's kind of like this. You know, we talk about hearing the voice of God and things like this. The reason why that is so mysterious to a bunch of Christians is because they haven't really renewed their mind with the word. And they're looking for a voice on the outside. Brother and I were talking about this other, 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 other day. There's sometimes that God's voice is so loud that it almost seems like it's not on. You talk about hearing voice. I've heard God's voice before. When I was walk, got in trouble from school, my mom said, hey, come baby, you don't walk on me. So I'm walking home, walking through a little trail in the forest, and I heard somebody call my name two times. And we're here periodically say, who's calling my name? Oh, there's a friend of mine. They're talking. And somebody said, Gerald, it was so loud. I said, man, why are y'all calling my name? I'm right here. And then, you know, I can't tell you what they say yet. But anyway, because <laughs> I was getting ready to stop myself. But I mean, you know, but I say, who oh, for years I wonder who was calling my name. But I didn't know about that until I went to church. And they read that out of Samuel, how God called him three times, and he didn't know who that one was calling. And then Samuel had the, uh, Eli had the instruction and said, That's God. If you hear it again, say it here I am. So you just don't know. What I'm saying is, I didn't know there was a voice of God until I read the scriptures. But I did hear his voice. A lot of us hear his voice. But we can't distinguish if it's him or not. 
because we don't know what to say. Yeah. That's why we do here, well, why we encourage you at the church, just read your Bible every day. I'm not talking about doing no real deep study, because sometimes that's a different thing, Brian. You get stuck on one thing, you know, and you, and, but just, it's just good to read. Just good to read, because I'm telling you, when you read, you're downloading into your spirit, man. And at the same time, you're renewing your mind whether you feel like it or not. And then when God speaks to you, the Holy Ghost does what? He brings things back to your remembrance, what you read. Yes. But if you don't read, you can't read that. That's not there. I mean, you, you see what I'm saying? So if I've read that, then when God speaks to me, say, now I know that's in the scriptures. I've read that before. I've read that in the scriptures. That's God. It's in the to me. I know it's God because it's in the book. So that's the key to walking in victory. And having right thinking and right believing is that we realize that God's not trying to do away with your mind, but it's a major part of your life. You know, I was uh, uh, got up early this morning, about six o'clock this morning, and, uh, and the Holy Ghost wanted me to share this with you. And uh, so, as soon as I woke up, the Spirit of God was speaking to me. He said, "Tell the people that every day they get up, that every day they get up." The battlefield is their minds. And he said if they can master their thoughts on an individual basis every day, they'll begin to rule and reign victorious in life. He said it takes a day at a time. If you get up every morning with that thinking, that today I go to the battlefield of my mind. Because every time a man gets up, he goes to war. He said, well, in his mind. In his mind. While I'm sleeping, I'm not at war. I'm sleeping. Unless the devil is trying to influence you through your dream. But you got a solution for that. You tell the devil on your parashas while you sleep. Tell those angels to stand guard by your bed. But every day you get up in the morning, understand that if I could, if I could bridle my thoughts during that day and set myself to say, hey man, whatever comes against my mind today, I'm quick. Holy Ghost, help me. I'm going to get the victory in every area of my mind. Man, I'm telling you, it change, totally changed our lives. That's what changed Paul's life. It changed a lot of people's lives in the Bible. Father, we thank you for the word this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we are victorious. We are not sheep. Count for this one. No, no. Because God loves us. There's nothing that can separate us from his love. I thank you, Father, there is a hedge of protection that is surrounding us. I thank you, Father, that you are our shield and our buckler. Thank you, Father, that every person that is here in this building this morning, that they have answers to the hard questions of life today. Father, we're asking you that Ephesians 1 be in manifestation in their lives this day. That the eyes of their mind is being enlightened. That they have answers. You're a God of answers. We don't dwell in darkness. We dwell in the light. And we are children of the light. Therefore, darkness cannot comprehend and get a hold of us. Father, we walk in divine health and prosper even as our soul is prosper. Father, we do declare that our thinking is right. Our believing is right. Because we have made a decision in our minds that you are true and everyone else is a liar. That's the decision we made. We made the word our only thought in our life. If you said it, it's self Father, we pray over our children and our grandchildren and our families. Father, we just read in your word that it's not your will that any man perish, but every man come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray over our loved ones, our family members, those that don't know you. We ask, we pray to you, the Lord of the hearts, that you send labors across their path to minister the good news to them, the gospel. But Father, I thank you, Father, that this word will not fall on the deaf ear, but it will fall on the hearing ear. Now, Satan, we bind you in Jesus' name, our loved ones. 
no longer will you prevent them from seeing the glorious light of the gospel. Father, we thank you for angelic hosts working with us. So therefore, we rejoice that we do have authority. Because our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and that we have authority over evil spirits. So I thank you, Father, Satan is bound, and the kingdom of God is loosed in our lives and their lives. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.